Founder fans, Jason here. Welcome to Founder of the Day Trivia. We are a day late. I apologize. Missed last week. This week's been crazy. It's the holiday season. I'm sure you understand. But we've got a lot of fun tonight. Got some. We're going to go through some reviews as per usual before we head on over to uh, play that trivia. I am going to pop this up right now and update the trivia time, the countdown in the corner here under countdown trivia. Let's say, uh, let's say 25 minutes. Okay. There we go. Countdown to trivia. It's going to be a blast. I hope you're all having a fantastic holiday season. I sure am so far so good. So let's, all right, going to minimize some of this. Oh, I opened things twice. Okay. That's why. Yeah. Get rid of that. All right. Now we're ready to go. So Got a bunch of people to talk about. Uh, like I said, I missed last week. I've actually missed a few days this week. I'm considering uh, reducing the daily founders to weekdays uh, to free up some time over the weekend to put more into everything else. That being said, uh, it's saying my bit rate is low, but the audio should be good. So we'll see how it goes. Anyway, let's start talking first about Aidenis Burke. I believe it's pronounced Aidenis. It's a silly looking name. <laughs> um, Aidenis Burke was a really interesting character, uh, important to revolutionary South Carolina, a real leader in revolutionary South Carolina, uh, fought a little bit in the war, did a whole bunch of different things, but he's most notable for two articles he's published uh, about the Society of the Cincinnati. So the Society of the Cincinnati was started after the, just closing out the Revolutionary War by many of the officers, especially the high-ranking officers of the Revolutionary War, who were looking around and saying, hey, those men in Philadelphia aren't paying us. And even after Newburgh, when George Washington said, ah, let's not do anything about it, they were looking at the Continental Congress and thinking, hey, all those doctors, lawyers, and merchants are going to go home and have jobs. And us soldiers, we might not have a lot of jobs. So they created the Society of the Cincinnati as a way for them to continue, essentially continue in their position uh, and, and have a role in society. Now, Aidenis Burke didn't like this primarily because it was a, to be a member, you had to be an officer in the war, or when you passed away, it was inherited by your oldest male heir. And for Aidenis Burke, that sounded a lot like how nobility works. And we didn't really care for nobility in the new United States, did we? Interestingly, uh, not only did Burke say this, but uh, Ben Franklin agreed with him. John Adams both publicly agreed with him. And even George Washington agreed with him. Washington, however, was chosen as the first president of the Society of the Cincinnati. And as such, he walked in and said, hey, Burke's right. We have to get rid of this rule. And they said, oh, okay. And they did, because you didn't say no to George Washington, especially in the early 1780s, fresh off the victory in the war. Uh, and they got rid of it. But uh, after a year or so, Washington resigns because he doesn't want to be in charge of anything nationally. He just wants to go home. Uh, but when he resigns, they the society quietly sneaks that rule back in. And it's actually that way to this day. Now, uh, they may, may have made exceptions for... for um, female heirs at this point. I don't remember 100%. I believe they did. Uh, but either way, that's still essentially how it operates. Uh, Burke would go on to be, I believe, a member of the House of Representatives for a while. And, you know, not the most famous guy, but an important person in revolutionary South Carolina. Moving along, doing our review. John Henry. So there were actually two John Henrys I published about in a row. I only put one up here. Uh, the first John Henry was a, an early, a governor of Maryland. Actually, at the end of his life, he was governor of Maryland. He, the first John Henry is most known for his time in the Continental Congress, stalling the Articles of Confederation from being ratified. It took several years to ratify it. Uh, the other John Henry from Maryland was saying, no, you know, this Western land, Virginia's claiming all this land in the West. We need to really reflect on whether or not we think Virginia should be the entire United States and all the rest of us should be a little sliver on the coast. Uh, and it was only after Virginia finally ceded the Western lands to the Continental Congress, which would later become part of the Northwest Ordinance and, uh, you know, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, Illinois, that area, uh, that would be ceded, and then Maryland would accept and ratify the Articles of Confederation. Uh, Henry, by then, unfortunately, had gone back to Maryland, didn't get to put his name on the document, but was a major player in that change, which was very important to the future United States. The, the um, 
fairly immediate future of the United States. This John Henry is a very strange character and a lot of fun, in fact. So this John Henry, we don't know a lot about his early life. He comes over to the United States and and during the George Washington administration, bounces around, doesn't really hold down a job, but does get appointed as a colonel, I believe it was colonel, uh, maybe a captain, in the um, quasi-war with France. Now that was mostly at sea, and he didn't take to the sea, but he did take command of several forts throughout the war, and even though it was fought at sea, you know, those French ships could have showed up at these por uh, forts, ports, harbor forts at any time, uh, and he was responsible for guarding those, and, and seems to have done a pretty good job. He then, re not retires, but goes, moves to Vermont, where he's contacted by the British government, and the British government, essentially, allegedly, the governor of Quebec gets him to spy on the Americans, and he sends a bunch of information back and forth with the promise of being paid. Unfortunately, the gentleman he was dealing with dies, and John Henry doesn't receive any money. So, Henry gets on his high horse, or better yet, a boat, and sails over to England, where England says, we don't know anything about you, we will not be paying you, sir. At this point, he sails back to North America, and he makes friends with some kind of con artist, uh, De Caron, I believe it was pronounced, a French con artist, who says, you should try and sell the information you have to President James Madison. And John Henry says, that's a great idea. I'm going to try and sell this to James Madison. Now, to be fair, uh, this was about the time the French, uh, the War of 1812 was, it wasn't underway yet, but the war hawks were war hawking and saying, hey, let's start this war already. And James Madison was really looking for a reason to go to war with Great Britain at this point. Being said, many, many people were very nervous about going to war, especially in New England, very against the War of 1812. Uh, Madison, kind of looking for a reason to launch the war, finally finds one in John Henry. This guy contacts James Madison and says, hey, I have these papers that prove I was working as a spy for the British against you. <laughs> and now, while you might think James Madison would say as president, well, that's treason, here's jail, that's not how it went down. In fact, it was quite the opposite. James Madison said, how much for those papers? Uh, I forget the exact number, but in today's money, it was hundreds of thousands, uh, millions of dollars. What I do remember it, is it was enough. James Madison could have built a brand new warship for the amount of money he gave James Henry for these papers that he then published, which riled the Democratic Republicans and the Warhawks and pushed the United States towards the War of 1812. That being said, the Federalists, who were a dying party at this point, but still a party, said, how do we know these aren't forged? How do we know you, James Madison, didn't forge them? Who's John Henry? And how do we know he didn't forge them? Also, shouldn't he be tried for treason because he was, he's claiming to have been spying on us for the enemy that you want to go to war with? What's going on here? Did, nothing really comes of this because the people at large were now pushed towards war, and war they had, war you shall receive, and they joined the War of 1812, the Federalist Party kind of quickly dies out, you know, they have the Hartford Convention from there, and that does not go well for them. Um, meanwhile, Andrew Jackson goes down to Louisiana, and it does go well for him, and uh, John Henry then sails over with his money to France, and the, the rest of his life gets super murky. Uh, he tries to claim land that he said he bought from the Caron, the, the con artist he had met years earlier, and France says, we don't know who that is, you don't have any land. Uh, he seemed to have made some money, because we do have a will that he leaves to his daughters, but he, what he's doing over in Europe is up in the air, so to speak. And that is a story that gets no airplay when you talk about the American Revolution. Uh, I had written about this guy first a few years ago. I don't even remember how I stumbled onto him, but so random uh, and kind of unbelievable that we don't have people talking about this story all the time. But now we have. Let's carry on. Ezekiel Cornell. So Ezekiel Cornell, uh, first of all, has nothing to do with Cornell the University both people can trace their ancestors back to a pilgrim who seems to have moved to 
from uh, Massachusetts to Rhode Island about the time of Roger Williams. But their lines diverge greatly from there. So they're not really related at all. However, this Ezekiel Cornell has a fascinating story. He joins the Continental Army. He was a mechanic, essentially an artisan, kind of from the lower levels of society. But as many people were able to do leading up to the revolution, he was able to excel his position in life and was elected to the local uh, town council, eventually the provincial government. Uh, and then he becomes, uh, uh, I remember, his, I think he was a current, I believe he was colonel in the Revolutionary War. I think at the end of the war, he gets a brevet to Brigadier General. Don't quote me on that. But he is a leader, and he is sent to, after the evacuation of Boston, while most of the Continental Army goes to New York City and waits around New York City uh, on the continent, Cornell is sent with his men to Long Island, where they are to route out loyalist sentiment because everyone knew the British was coming. The British had left Boston and gone to Canada and were waiting for the Navy, and they were definitely coming back. And they, uh, Cornell is on Long Island trying to route out British sentiment. Uh, about the same time, you have uh, Nathaniel Woodhull pushing out all the cattle. He's pushing, Woodhull's trying to push the cattle east. Uh, Cornell is going west. He takes over a church in Hempstead, which is now Nassau County, but at the time, uh, Suffolk, Queens and Suffolk met in the middle of what Nassau now is uh, for those handful of people who care about Long Island counties. Uh, uh, I grew up there, so it's sentimental to me. Anyway, Cornell uh, goes in, takes over a church, kind of gets in some trouble because he treats the church very poorly. Uh, he doesn't let the citizens, he lets them pray, but he doesn't let them uh, pray for the king or parliament, which is interesting. Uh, this is just before the Declaration of Independence. Then word comes around that there was a conspiracy to assassinate General Washington. Cornell is uh, one of the people involved with this conspiracy is the mayor of New York City, Dave Matthews, David Matthews, not Dave Matthews, the rock and roll star. This is my air guitar. It's a very tiny guitar. Not Dave Matthews, the rock and roll star. Dave Matthews, the mayor of New York City. And Cornell is sent into New York City just as the British are hanging out outside the uh, off the shores of New York. And Cornell goes in and arrests the mayor, Dave Matthews, of New York City. Uh, he's then sent to Connecticut, where his parole is very loose, and he runs right back to New York City, so it was kind of all for naught, but Cornell did get to arrest the mayor of New York City, which is an interesting fun fact. Next is Joseph Hawley. So, Hawley is an amazingly under-discussed person. Like, even those of us, if you're watching this channel, you probably like the American Revolution a little bit more than most people you know as do I. And unfortunately, even in circles like ours, if I said the name Sam Adams, everyone knows that name. If I said the name J James Otis, you might recognize that name as someone who studies the American Revolution. Joseph Hawley is not a name most people would recognize, but Hawley is right up there with those other two. In fact, I read some arguments, not that I agree with them, but I read some arguments that Hawley actually inspired Sam Adams and, to a degree, James Otis. He was a contemporary of Otis. In fact, uh, during the 17, uh, leading into the 1760s, Hawley took on a young law student named John Adams. And Joseph Hawley really helped train John Adams in the law. It worked out seemingly pretty well. And uh, Hawley is an early radical. He's early pushing for, um, not necessarily independence, but he writes so okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, when the time for the First Continental Congress comes, Hawley is one of the people meeting secretly to choose the delegates to go to Philadelphia and represent Massachusetts. He's actually floated to be one of the delegates, but it's decided not to send him, and I found this fascinating. He, they choose not to send him because he had never had, nor was he inoculated against smallpox. And at the time, Philadelphia was, well, was kind of known for having some smallpox hanging around. John Adams, on the other hand, had been inoculated by Dr. Joseph Warren. So he was chosen to go in Hawley's stead. And when he goes, Hawley writes a letter to John Adams. It's called the Broken Hints Letter. And it's a really important letter that's often overlooked. Essentially, I don't have the quotes in front of me here, I apologize. But he basically says, like, we need to unite. Uh, yes, there's going to be a boycott. Everyone essentially knew they'd say there would be a boycott after the First Continental Congress, but Hawley said we need to do more. 
Holy said, the boycott is going to start a war, and we need to train the militias, we need to raise funds for the militias, and we need to find a way to organize our militias on a united front. This is in the summer of 1774. Very few people are talking like this. Even just a, you know, 10, 8 months before Lexington and Concord, very few people are actually talking about arming an army. He also talks about the need to come together, essentially alluding to the United States Constitution 13 years before it happens, before the war is even fought. You have Hawley talking about this. It's fascinating. Unfortunately for Hawley, he falls ill. He de His father had uh, committed suicide when he was a young man. And he actually was one of the people pushing to get Jonathan Edwards, the famous fire and brimstone preacher of the Great Awakening. He said that Hawley's dad committed suicide and had these mental health problems because he was a sinner. So years later, Edwards got under the skin of a lot of his constituents. Hawley was one of the leaders to get him out. Uh, years go by and Hawley suddenly falls into kind of a funk that he never comes out of. And it's hard to determine exactly why this happened. He was a well-spoken lawyer, a leader of men, a, a, a important radical, and then all of a sudden he just no, he kind of falls off the, the earth. It's not dissimilar from who I mentioned before, James Otis, another early firebrand who really pushed for the rebellion. Major, major players in the start of the hostilities themselves who both lost their minds. Now. Otis, he was hit in the head a few times, and it seems like that has something to do with it. Hawley, it just seems to have been part of his family history. Uh, and unfortunately, that's by 1776, he's out of it. 1774, he's sending John Adams to Philadelphia and saying, we're going to need to start an army and unite and form a new nation. And two years later, he's just out, which is fascinating. Uh, side note, personally, uh, growing up, there's a town not named after this Joseph Hawley. Seems like it's named after a... Uh, train a uh, railroad not baron but industrialist uh whose first name escapes me but my grandparents grew up uh, growing up i would go to pennsylvania where my grandparents lived in a very small town called hawley pennsylvania it's a beautiful little place uh so whenever i talk about this guy i think of that so i want to give a shout out to my grandparents who are definitely not watching <laughs> uh and let's move on tench tillman i'm gonna take a quick sip of water here tench tillman Tench Tillman's story parallels a lot John Lawrence, and John Lawrence has become famous because of the musical Hamilton, which he's in, and Tench Tillman is not in. Uh, Tillman was a little bit older, but uh, okay, let me start at the beginning. The Tillman family of Maryland was an, an extremely important family leading up to the Revolution, and as I always say, this, the Revolutionary War was a civil war. No one proves that better than the Tillmans. Tillman's father and brother brothers were loyalists, and Tillman sided with the Patriots, and it really broke the relationship with his immediate family for the rest of his life. His uncle, however, was Matthew Tillman, uh, a leader, the first president of the Maryland Provincial Assembly, a delegate to the First Continental Congress, uh, actually a much more important American founder than Tench was. Uh, Tench goes on to join the fight, he is pretty quickly promoted to aide-de-camp to George Washington and a military secretary. Now, many of the young men in George Washington's family, as they called it, were younger men, 23 and under. Tillman was 31 at the time. Uh, he and Robert Hanson Harrison were the old men of the family, so to speak, and they both acted as military secretary. Robert Hanson Harrison is generally considered to be what we would consider today a, a chief of staff. Tillman was Number two on that list, really important to George Washington, uh, spoke French fluently, which was important because Washington would dictate letters that many, many of Washington's letters are in Tench Tillman's hand. Tench would write them down. Uh, the French also helped when Baron von Steuben comes over to help reorganize the army. He's there for a good portion of the time, translating the German to, uh, okay, no, no, uh, Steuben had French as a second language as did Tillman, so translating Stoyben's broken French into regular English. Uh, although, you know what? I shouldn't say that. I'm sure Stoyben lived in France for quite some time. I'm sure he spoke French just fine. I should not have said that. Uh, anyway, Tillman is with Washington the entirety of the war. He's there at the Battle of Yorktown, and he is given the, I think it's an honor, 
of getting on his horse and riding to Philadelphia after the Battle of Yorktown to announce to the Continental Congress that we've taken the British Army and the war has essentially been won. He gets the victory ride. So, Tench Tillman over there. Also, again, uh, as I like to say, love the name Tench. My spouse did not let me name my child Tench. I really like it. He's not the only Tench in the revolution. I think it's a last name that a few people took on as a first name. Think about Tench Cokes, the economist also. Anyway, unfortunately for Tillman, he was always sick. He was even sick on his ride from Yorktown to Philadelphia. Uh, and it's interesting because I've seen him complain about Robert Hanson Harrison taking sick leave when they were both sick. <laughs> Why does he take the leave? Uh, not, although we've spoken about Han Robert Hanson Harrison. Let's not give him any trouble, please. Uh, and But because of this, he passes away young at like 41 years old in 1786. So he doesn't even see the nation come to fruition because Washington had amazing respect for this man and more than likely would have brought him up as a, um, uh, had him do something in the federal government. I, I, it's hard to believe he would not have. David Cobb. Uh, David Cobb is another young man, even younger than Tench Tillman, who was also part of George Washington's family during this whole time. He joins Washington at Yorktown. But instead of riding to Philadelphia, David Cobb goes with George Washington on a little bitsy trip. You see, Yorktown's in Virginia. And George Washington was from Virginia. And he had not been to Mount Vernon many times throughout the, at that point, six years of war. So he said, hey, I just won a war against the greatest empire in the world. I'm going to stop home for a little celebratory dinner. And David Cobb is one of the handful of people who, <laughs> excuse me, who chokes on their own words when they're live. <laughs> excuse me. <coughs> oh boy, ah, I ruined the surprise. David Cobb is one of the handful of people who gets to have a celebratory dinner to celebrate the victory at Yorktown with George Washington at Mount Vernon. Pretty sweet. He then goes back to Massachusetts, where he's from. He, he builds a career in state government. He uh, supports the Constitution. He spends some time in the House of Representatives. He's actually the only person to represent the at-large district. Uh, this is kind of fun. There were... Elections were held differently in each state, and Massachusetts had this thing where they would... Each district would vote for one person, but they didn't have enough districts to fill all their seats in the House of Representatives. So they had an at-large district, which was everyone in Massachusetts could vote for this one representative. You got two votes, one for your local representative, one for the at-large representative. They only had this for one session. And the only person ever to be Massachusetts at-large representative was David Cobb. He later moves to Massachusetts, uh, I'm sorry, um, what we now know as Maine, comes important out there and eventually is elected as lieutenant governor of Massachusetts, the state he really helped to build. And I've left out a whole lot, but we're running out of time. It's almost trivia time. Do that trivia. Uh, last but not least, Joseph Norse, who, as you see next to me, I've seen him. Uh, there's a the one book about him calls him America's first civil servant. So there's another young man joins the war, another aide de camp, but he's an aide de camp to Charles Lee, who, you know, Charles Lee. But uh, he does well. He ends up uh, resigning his position to go work for the Board of War. Uh, while he's working, he's a secretary for the Board of War. He bounces around a bunch of clerical positions for the Continental Congress, which are not elected positions. The Continental Congress actually hired people to do work. We talk about Charles Thompson, the secretary. He was paid to be there. Uh, Joseph Norse was paid to be there. Uh, and by after the Articles of Confederation are ratified, he is chosen as Register of the treasury and the register of the treasury is essentially bookkeeper and it, it's a position that he had and it was around for a while then it goes away then it came back and now it's gone again uh there's a few things i actually didn't write about in my articles he was the one who actually signed the papers uh by papers i mean dollars the continentals those worthless continentals you know how if you look at a dollar bill right now it's signed by the treasurer that's a printed copy. They didn't have printed copies back then. He signed every dollar that was put into circulation. And then once George Washington becomes president, well, he actually retains Joseph Norris in this position. Not only him, George Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, James Monroe, John Quincy Adams, all kept Joseph Norris as registrar of the treasury. He was signing those bills for the first 
50 years of the United States, almost. The first six presidential administrations, despite who was the party in charge, Joseph Norse was the guy chosen to sign the checks. Unfortunately, when Andrew Jackson comes around, he wants to make some changes. He outs Joseph Norse uh, from the position, but Norse at this point is 75 years old and he's ready to retire anyway, so it's not a huge deal, though, and I forgot to write this in my article, uh, when he left, Andrew Jackson and some of his party affiliates accused Norse of embezzling money. Uh, Norse actually said, no, you owe me money. And it went to court, and he was right. They actually, although he was accused of embezzlement, after a thorough investigation, he ends up being paid more money because you're not going to tell the bookkeeper that he's doing the books wrong, I guess. I guess you can. I shouldn't have said that. I, I saw the time running out, so I had to, I had to do it real quick. <laughs> but that's the story of Joseph Norse. That's the, 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 the sum up this evening. Uh, why don't we go over here to trivia? You know, I'm going to blank this out real quick. Uh, before we get trivia, let me know if you're here. There's not a whole bunch of people watching. Uh, unfortunately, Fridays we were tough the last two weeks, but I didn't want to go two weeks without doing a trivia. So, hey, it was just me talking to myself. That's okay. If you're here watching, uh, type it in. Let me know if you're here. Let, we're about to do some trivia. I see people popping in because it's 830 and this is when the fun part starts. Everyone's like, ah, I know, I know what's going on. Uh, let me know you're here. It'll pop up over on the other side there. I will see it here. Um, want to make sure there's people playing the games if we're playing the games. So throw that in there. Um, I'll throw the first question up. We'll give it some time. Uh, Lauren, Lauren made it. Okay. Are, are, are Saturdays better for you, Lauren? I, I am considering changing Fridays. I have some overlap coming. I might either have to push Fridays back a little bit or change the day slightly um in a few weeks full transparency uh i joined i got asked to join a bowling league up the street and i wanted to do that all my life i bought a house down the street from a bowling alley for that reason and it's friday nights and i know it's selfish of me but uh, <laughs> i mean dreams come true lauren <clears throat> just me and you it's just me and you let me change the uh timer very abruptly where'd it go where's the timer oh i'm clicking the wrong button let me change it. oh did i close it that's probably why there it is it is the trivia uh timer games timer dash games there it is we're gonna cut that down to one minute and we're good and now i can just blank it out temp works oh great well good i'm glad things have oh I'm glad I slammed my hand on the table in celebration to jar everything in the world, but I'm also glad things of uh, uh, situations is changing for you, bud. Uh, let's see. Let's see if you got it, Lauren. Anyone popping in right now, let us know you're here. Timer's on. Which New Hampshire signer of the Declaration of Independence did not sign next to the rest of the delegates from his state? And I'm just realizing I forgot to mention this person earlier. I... <laughs> Uh, I was, I, I had to squeeze two weeks worth of people in. I very much meant to put this person up. So can you name a signer of the declaration from New Hampshire? I will give you credit if you get any signer from New Hampshire, uh, in the next 30 seconds. If not, don't feel bad. Name anyone from New Hampshire and we'll be happy about that. As time ticks down, another sip of water. I'm still choking on my throat from before. <gasps> I'm, and I and now I'm stalling for time. 15 seconds. You gotta guess. You gotta guess. I'm a little bit ahead of you. Oh, I can see because I have it up here. I am like five seconds ahead of you guys. So it's not the greatest. Uh, I will not hit the button in the future until time is there. No, sorry. Uh, that's okie dokie, Lauren. It is Matthew Thornton. I forgot. To, I can't believe I forgot to mention him. Uh, I left out a signer of the declaration. Uh, Matthew Thornton was from uh, New Hampshire really important he was a physician actually that makes his way into the colonial assembly uh, colonial assembly is one of the leaders of revolutionary um a real a real leader of revolutionary massachusetts but i mean new hampshire uh he helps write the constitution is sent to the constitutional con uh, the continental congress uh, when he gets there he gets there in november of 1776 so a lot of people had already signed including the other two guys from uh, new hampshire Josiah Bartlett and name escaping me. Is it? It's not John Lang. It's not John. It's not John Langdon. Oh, it's bothering me. Anyway, 
See, I can't remember him either, Lauren. Don't worry about it. Uh, they get there. He gets there in November, a few months after they sign it. And he says, can I still sign it? And they're like, yeah. So he squeezes his name at the bottom underneath Connecticut. So he's the, the only guy who doesn't really sign with the rest of his delegation. Uh, let's move on. Let's do another question here. Okay. What did Aidenis Burke and others dislike about the Society of the Cincinnati? What didn't they like about the Society of the Cincinnati? Uh, just to remind you, the Society of the Cincinnati was a, an organization created by the uh, generals and, and other high-ranking officers in the Continental Army. Excuse me. Uh, about the, you know, uh, to give themselves an organization to rely on each other, for lack of a better term. Uh, uh, a veterans association, basically, though it was only for high-ranking officers in the army. Uh, and it was largely because they looked over at the Continental Congress, as I said before, they saw doctors and lawyers and merchants who were going to leave now that the war was won and go back to their wealthy careers, as opposed to the, the officers in the war who were soldiers for the most part. Many of them had other businesses, but a lot of them were soldiers as a career and were scared that they would have no career afterward. Uh, and Lauren coming in with cronyism right as the countdown. Yes, essentially cronyism. Uh, uh, membership was hereditary, was the real main thing. But cronyism is a good way to put it because the, the real phrase was nobility. He was afraid it was nobility because only the oldest male heir could inherit that title. And that didn't sit right with him. They were also upset. So uh, Aidenis Burke was actually, uh, uh, I think was a colonel or a captain. He fought, uh, led men in the South Carolina militia, and he did not like how they did not include militia officers. So that little bit of jealousy probably had something to do with it. Now, didn't it? <laughs> okay, moving right along. What major event was sparked by the John Henry Papers? The John Henry Papers. Now, not to confuse you, uh, some people popping in now. Let us know you're here. Give us a guess. We're always happy to have more people playing along. There were... Uh, Saturday is not, not as busy as Friday usually is. Okay, well, we'll do Friday again next week. Because next week's Christmas. So, ha ma Merry... Happy happy Christmas. Merry Holidays, as they say. Uh, we'll be doing it on Friday next week. Uh, John Henry... There We talked about two John Henrys. One was from Maryland. Ended up being a governor of Maryland. That's not this guy. Uh, this guy was a spy, for lack of a better term, who was spying on the United States, and when Great Britain didn't pay him, he tried to sell it to the United States, and for whatever reason, little Jemmy Madison thought that was fine, didn't find one problem with the treason, so long as he could make a little bit of, get the politics he wanted out of it. If you think that kind of politics is a new thing, I assure you it's not. As always, we got a cat opening the door, that's what that creaking is. Not a ghost. Our ghosts are more polite when we're doing live videos. <laughs> As I say that, a ghost pops up behind me, right? John Henry Papers uh, essentially led to the War of 1812. Whoopsie daisy, Mr. Madison. Uh, he used it as propaganda for the War of 1812. As I said before, the Federalists who were against the war were like, why? How do we know that's not forged? And also, shouldn't you be arresting that guy of treason? <laughs> Moving right along. Joseph Norse, so the last guy we just talked about. Joseph Norse served in the administrations of the first six presidents. What office did he hold? So what was the name of his office? A really fascinating one. So I didn't mention, I did say how this office kind of disappeared for a while and came back uh, after between the Civil War and World War One. It was back for a while. And it's interesting, it was one of the few positions that uh, black men primarily were able to hold I shouldn't say primarily. A bunch of black dudes actually had this position uh, for a, a solid like 15, 20 years in there. Uh, it was one of the highest offices black men could achieve in the executive branch of the United States government uh, for that time period. Till Woodrow Wilson came around. Good old Woodrow Wilson really setting everyone back literally 50 years. Uh, and yeah, yeah, not a big Woodrow Wilson fan over here. Just in case you didn't know. Lauren coming through with the correct answer. Since it's just you, Lauren, I'll jump ahead. Yeah, Register of the Treasury. Uh, it's a really interesting position. We still have registers in local government. I don't think this is currently a position in the federal government anymore. Like I said, it went and came back. The, the tasks 
that's a hard word to get out. The tasks are still carried out, of course. The books are still kept, uh, but not under that particular moniker. So, question the next. Ezekiel Cornell. What was the mayor of New York City accused of when he was arrested by Ezekiel Cornell? Uh, we said before, Ezekiel Cornell, he's famous for arresting the mayor of New York City. That would have been interesting. That mayor of New York City, Dave Matthews, not in the rock and roll band. Not yet. But what was he arrested for? Uh, Troy coming in. Uh, War of 1812 was my first interest in history. Grew up in the Livingston area. Wow, that's fascinating, Troy, because War of 1812 is most people's <laughs> least favorite. Uh, I lo I'm very interested in it, too. I know you say you're from Lewiston, so like upstate New York. We were... Much like the American Revolutionary War, the battles in upstate New York in the War of 1812 are, I mean, the War of 1812 is largely overlooked, but uh, it just an extra, New York was extraordinarily important. This was the war grounds for the War of 1812, although a lot of it was at sea in the Great Lakes, which are seas in all but name. I will give the answer right here, though. Uh, he was conspiring to assassinate General Washington. That's was what was he was charged with uh oh oh your answer comes through right as i'm saying it uh treason collusion with gb uh yeah uh yes essentially i mean uh it, so david matthews was mayor of new york city he was a loyalist britain loved what he was doing so i guess he was colluding with them but it was more directly the assassination plot of washington was the reason they gave although at that point they were essentially routing out any loyalists in power that they possibly could before the British came in. Because, again, the British were right there on the waters outside of the city. Uh, we covered that last week. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. Okay. Uh, next query. Oh. Who rode from Yorktown to inform the Continental Congress the war had been won? Who was given this great honor? I always get confused with the road, with the road, 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 road with war, with war, with words. Uh, road, war, road. I always forget which road I'm supposed to use. I think he rode this spelling on the road, R-O-A-D. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, we covered that last week or so. The lifeguards. Oh, we did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Caleb Gibbs was in charge of Washington's lifeguards. Another young man who's like kind of considered part of the family. By the way, the answer to this question is one of the gentlemen in the family, the Washington's military family. Caleb Gibbs was kind of, but kind of not. He was in charge of the lifeguards, so he was always there with Washington. And more than just guarding Washington's life, they were also supposed to guard the money of the Continental Army and the belongings of Washington in the Continental Army. So he was there. He was always in conversation with them, uh, participating in that nation, uh, na nature, but not really... I don't believe he was consulted on policy or, or tactics or anything of that nature. Uh, Lauren, nothing coming in. Tench Tillman. I would have accepted Tench. <laughs> Great name. Tench Tillman. Uh, again, not like the sexiest name in the world, but a really important... Um, one of the men Washington was consulting with throughout almost the entirety of the war. Tillman was there. And, uh, you know, played a big hand, like I said before. And a big role in helping... Uh, Baron von Steuben reconfigure the army into an actual army <laughs> uh, and got that special victory lap from General George. Excuse me. And it's a great name, isn't it? Uh, we're talking about another aide de camp in this question. So, which aide de camp celebrated the victory at Yorktown with the general at Mount Vernon? So, the general is George Washington. Uh, which aide de camp got to have? Victory dinner at Yorktown with George Washington. I will note there is, a, I have a regular viewer uh, on this channel who shares this name. So I don't know if they are here right now. I don't think so. It seems to be just you tonight, Lauren, which is fine. We're having fun. You and me. Fun time. Uh, but there is people, I, I at least appreciate people popped in to hit like if they couldn't stay. There's three likes and one person hanging out. So that's amazing. Thank you guys. Um, <laughs> thank you who are not here. Uh, but yes, uh, this person shares a name. I think it might actually be a baseball player's name too. That's a help. But uh, 
they left a comment when I did the video this week. They actually left a comment. I just, I did, I did, I told everyone. <laughs> All one of you watching, I let you know. Uh, and it is David Cobb. He ends up going on to be Lieutenant Governor of Massachusetts. It's not really named people know, but there he is. His family knows. His mother loves him. Maybe. I guess I shouldn't make that assumption. All right, question number the eighth. Who received the third amount of votes in the first presidential election? So this is a reference to the live video we did a few weeks ago. I was seeing if you were going to, uh, the countdown video of the men who lost to Washington. I'm just basically testing to see if you remember any of it. I will say it's a pretty popular name. It should be in your first 15 guesses. If you rattle off 15 names, this will be one of them. There's a reason they came in third after George and John and then this guy. So, I mean, I'm not spoiling it. George Washington. Lauren, I'm sure you know, John Adams was the, came in second on this particular guess. Uh, Je Lauren coming in with Jefferson. No, Thomas Jefferson did not receive any votes in the first presidential election, which is always surprising to me too, because there was like nine or 10 people who did receive votes. Granted, a bunch of them were people from Georgia and they got one vote from someone else from Georgia. <laughs> so Georgia just really wanted to throw some votes away to their favorite sons. It is John Jay with nine votes to John Adams, like 34 and George Washington, 68. So he lost pretty handedly. Uh, but, you know, there we go. John Jay. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, it's funny, he gets no votes in that first election, and then in the second election, he gets a bunch of votes. Uh, and I think Aaron Burr gets a vote or two in that second election. And then the third election, is John, you know, they're both in the top four. And keeps getting better for there. <laughs> All right. Number nine. All right, now I've been doing these fairs. I don't know if you've been watching the Federalist Papers. I know they're a little long. They're a little dry for a lot of people, uh, but I've been doing them, and so I wanted to ask a question because the last several papers are all similar, and it, it's, uh, let me put it on the timer. In Federalist Papers 15 through 24, what have Hamilton and Madison been using to convince the public to support the Constitution? What topic have they, what, what, what have they been writing about? That is their way of convincing people. I didn't know how to ask this question, but I really want to put it out there because it is important. It's been fun. Uh, it's been kind of confusing. A lot of them, like, why are you, why? why? <laughs> a lot of them don't even make a ton of sense to me personally. I mean, I, I definitely see their argument. If you watch the videos, you see me hash it out and try and explain what they're trying to do. Uh, but then I also add my two cents, which is what are you talking about? <laughs> uh, sorry, I keep clapping my hands together, but. Oh, those Federalist Papers. Oh, they can really get under my skin. Uh, okay. And we're waiting. And we're waiting. Lauren, nothing. Nothing coming through. I got three. I got two. And I got one. History lessons. Fun history lessons. Uh, for, nope. So we're not there yet. Actually, they don't talk a lot about the, the free speech and press. I will say... Uh, Hamilton and Madison were against the Bill of Rights. Madison comes around on the Bill of Rights when he's running for office later, and he's running against James Ma he he's running against James Monroe actually to be an inaugural member of the House of Representatives. He expected to be appointed as a senator, but the Anti Federalists in Virginia did not let that happen. So then he has to run for House of Representatives, and while he's doing that, he realizes how many people don't like the fact that there's no Bill of Rights, and therefore he has to publicly change his opinion to win election to the first House of Representatives, where he goes on to help uh, author the Bill of Rights. Uh, we have the Anti-Federalists to thank for the Bill of Rights. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, Second Amendment, Third, Fourth, Fifth, Sixth, Seventh, Eighth, Ninth, Tenth Amendments. We all get from the Anti-Federalists because they made such a stink during the ratification process that they had to do it. These particular papers, they are uh, the same subject continued. They're basically, the point is to talk trash about the Articles of Confederation, but they do so through history lessons. Hamilton was like talking about feudal England, or not, or just feudal Europe. Uh, Madison was talking about, he talks about ancient Greece. Uh, then he talks about 
uh, Germany, the German Empire, and the Holy Roman Empire, essentially. Uh, it's very peculiar, but they are history lessons. So, so it is fun to learn history from the people in history that I and we enjoy studying. So it is a refreshing breath of fresh air learning the history from them, but their arguments I don't particularly care for. Luckily, we're getting through. And the last one is not going to be American Revolution related. Spoiler alert, it's kind of Christmas related and kind of history related. What did Bing Crosby do differently that changed music forever? I learned this the other day uh, and I thought it would be fun. It's probably very difficult because if you've never heard it, you're not going to know. Uh, but the the big song is, what is it? Um, uh, White Christmas, that famous White Christmas that he Bing Crosby's dreaming of that is in every store every year all the time. We all know it. Our parents know it. Our grandparents know it. Our many of us, our great grandparents, were familiar with it. Uh, it is just one of the most popular songs of all time. But when what made Bing Crosby and the way he used his voice different? I know, I know, Lauren. I I thought there would be more people guessing. I know it's really hard. <laughs> totally out of the blue. Really not relevant to what we're discussing at all. But. Now that time's up, he whispered into the microphone. So, microphones, you know, crooning. So, yeah, essentially, yeah, good, Lauren. Uh, crooning was more or less what he did. He was the first crooner. People started crooning after him. i am always been a music nerd, too, so forgive me. But, um, first, they, when they first invented the recording devices, there was the big horn on the end, and... The whole band and the vocalists all had to record at the same time. So the band would have to stand in the back of the room and the other artists would stand up front to sing louder than the band behind them. And that's why they have those, oh, Jamie voices. Because that's the only way. Well, your wife did a great job, Lauren. <laughs> the, the reason, like, they sing in those weird old timey voice. I can't do it. But they do that because that's the best way. Those frequencies are the best way for those old speakers, the like horn looking things, to catch the singer's voice over a full band behind them. But uh, in the 1920s, they started inventing better microphones. So when Bing Crosby starts to really to become popular, he was smart enough to realize, oh, forgive me if this is horrible to listen to, but if I get real close to the microphone and I whisper, it sounds louder than the band but it's quieter, so I can make my voice very sensual like this. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. As opposed to the, like, bellowing that they always used to do. Stage actors used to sing from their diaphragm and be as loud as they could from the stage so the people in the back of the theater could hear them. Bing Crosby realized I can sing just nice and close to the microphone and be very gentle. And, and that changed the game. Like, almost... Ever, I don't care what kind of music you like, but if you like any music from the 1930s forward, Bing Crosby had changed you, you, you appreciate the voices of the singers better because of Bing Crosby. Even the singers who sing loud, even the rock singers, wow, they like still sing into the microphone and they adjust the microphone appropriately for the volume of their voice. So. I know that's totally random. Someone just popped in the end for that. That is not American Revolution, but I learned it. I thought it was fascinating history, uh, especially going into Christmas time. Every once in a while, you got to pop off from the American Revolution and talk about some other form of history. Uh, I do uh, wish you guys a happy holiday. I am going to be doing trivia on Friday this week. Uh, oh, the following week. Oh, it's Christmas Eve, huh? Oh, it is Christmas Eve. Holiday in. All right, right on. I don't know if I have a favorite Bing Crosby. I haven't seen that many Bing Crosby movies. I'll be honest, I've seen a lot of Jimmy Sharp, but I have not seen a lot of Bing Crosby. Uh, probably because I, I I don't do a lot of impressions, but I feel like I've got, I've got Jimmy Sharp pretty good. No, I can't do it now. I'm on the spot. I've been talking for an hour. But if I had some time. My other one is Axl Rose. I got a good Axl Rose, but there are some kids sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> a few rooms over so i can't whip out the jungle right now 
maybe next week. Uh, I am, as I'm speaking, realizing, I was like, oh, it's the day before Christmas on Friday, so I can do it Friday, and the next week is the day before New Year's, and I'm realizing now that's Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve. Uh, so maybe I will, maybe we'll do trivia on Thursday. Uh, I am not entirely sure. You're in your 60s. Okay, so, so, welcome to the jungle. <laughs> right? Right? The 80s, you were younger than me in the 80s, so, <laughs> uh, I will assume you are Guns N' Roses fans and nothing else. How's that? <laughs> That's not very nice. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'll pop myself up big here for the end. Uh, yeah, I enjoy older movies too. Um, I Well, I'm out of focus on this screen. Well, what are you going to do? Uh, I enjoy older movies too. I turn to classic movies. Back when I had cable, I have since gone to the internet way to save some money. But I used to really enjoy uh, Turner Classic movies. That was literally in college. I was the kid putting that on the TV to fall asleep to. Uh, watching, you know, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington and stuff like that. Uh, Rolling Stones. Mm, okay. <laughs> I like the Rolling Stones. I was never uh, too enthralled by them, if I'm being honest. Uh, Mick Jagger's certainly a character. Not necessarily my favorite character. I don't know why I said that. Not my least favorite character of the thousands of people in history I read about. Uh, although he's still alive, so I can't really even call him history yet, can I? He will live forever. Um, yeah, I, I, man, I'm drawing a blank on all the music I like to listen to. Maybe next time. So I will tell you, Lawrence, that you're here. I am going to have start having uh, Sunday night for Patriots over on Patreon uh, do a live session where I talk about just some of the other things I've learned. Oh, the monkeys. Dude, uh, what's his name just passed away? Mikey. Mikey just passed away. I was literally playing monkey songs on my piano all week long because I heard he passed away. And my, my mother was a big monkeys fan. You want another fist, fun, fun history fact? I believe the year was 1967. The monkeys are that. Oh, I meant to make this my last trivia question. I was thinking today. I was like, what was that music question? What was that music question? I went with Bing Crosby. No, it was the monkeys. The monkeys, I would have asked it in question form. The monkeys are the only band to have four number one albums in one calendar year. 1967, the year starts. I forget the names of the album, but the year starts. They had a number one album. Someone else overtook them. They came out with another album. So the Beatles overtook them with whichever one came out in 67. Then the Monkees had another number one album. And at the end of the year, they had another number one album. There are several artists, including the Beatles and Elvis, who had three number one albums in a year. But the Monkees are the only band to, or only artist to ever have four Monkey uh number one albums in one year you you have the guitar and all are you are you putting me on right now i love the monkeys <laughs> i i that's amazing one well i've certainly learned something about you this week uh you and my mom would get along swimmingly uh that's amazing maybe you did know that fun fact that they are the only band with four number one billboard albums in one calendar year We're on the same page here, bud. <laughs> We're on the same page here. Uh, I am. I've, we've made a connection. I've literally been playing monkey albums all week long. The guitar is classic too. Uh, there's a band that I that they're a little bit newer. I mean, I was listening to them in high school, so like late '90s, called Phantom Planet. If you've ever seen a movie with the actor Jason Schwartzman in it, uh, he used to play drums in a band called Phantom Planet. Uh, with PH for Phantom, uh, they are, I don't know, is that how you usually spell Phantom? Maybe it is. Uh, you might want to check them out because they have that same kind of sound. Uh, there's actually a lot, a take on one of their albums where they all stop, they're like starting to play a song and they stop and they hear, you hear the monkeys on the radio and they're like, the monkeys! And they're rocking out. So they like very much are inspired by that particular band. Uh, monkeys who don't get nearly enough credit for being number... Four number one albums during Beatlemania. <laughs> like, that is incredible. 
It is an incredible achievement that is always overlooked. I love him. Was just playing last Shane to Clark's <laughs> like literally two days ago. Uh, with that, I am gonna go, Lauren. I am gonna have something tomorrow night. I'm thinking about seven on my time. You're on the you're in the Eastern time zone, I believe. So tomorrow about seven, uh, I'm gonna send out an email tomorrow morning for the Patreon on Patreon. Talk a little bit about what I've been doing here. I've missed some days recently. I am gonna make some changes. I'm thinking about going to five days a week. For the daily founders, the the trivia, the rest of the stuff, I'll keep the same, but uh, instead of 13. Top of the evening, low range. Well, welcome. We are just saying adieu. Uh, unfortunately, things went a little bit quicker this evening because it was just Lauren, so we kind of ripped through the questions. I apologize. Uh, I didn't want to go two weeks without a trivia. I did it a day late. I really appreciate you showing up. Uh, I'm probably going to do trivia on Thursdays this week and next week because it's Christmas Eve. As I was saying before, I would thought, hey, it's the day before Christmas. No one will be busy Friday the day before Christmas. And literally, I was just talking here and realized, oh, that means it's Christmas Eve. People are going to be busy on Christmas Eve now, aren't we? This is America. Uh, so probably on Thursday, we'll do another trivia. Maybe a little bit of abbreviated one. Uh, and you also missed a long conversation about the monkeys. Uh, low range. Just, just so you know, the Monkees are probably the most underappreciated band of the 1960s. Four number one albums during the height of Beatlemania. We all have to learn to live with that. <laughs> with that, and everyone's popping in now. Okay, guys, well, I apologize that I'm, I'm bailing now uh, because trivia ran through a little bit quick, but it was a good time. Uh, Thursday, we'll do another trivia because of the holidays, so you don't have to wait too long. Again, if you want to support the channel, check out the Patreon page. Uh, I'm going to be doing a live video on Patreon for patreons tomorrow I'll send it out in an email thank you guys i am all done here and uh what is the phrase uh peace field and that's the wrong button well now you know who's coming up later this week i've, I've jumped ahead look for david Hussey. the doctor who was in attendance on the hamilton bird duel will be discussed on tuesday see ya <laughs>